Hello, everybody. I'm JJ. I'm Jam. I'm Jack. I'm Jake. And I'm Jamie. And welcome to It's Time Red Couch Discussion. So for this episode, we're going to be doing something different, which is reading this book called The Alchemist. Ooh. I actually read this a really, really, really long time ago, forgot about it, decided to reread it, and thought, hey, this is, this is everything we've been raised with, as in the law of attraction, compressed into a little fictional book. Woo! Fictional, yay! Fiction. It's uh, like the, some other good stories. You know the hero's journey, right? We did a session with that before. <laughs> yeah. So this is the hero's journey. It's a classic book. So we're gonna read one, uh, Page one time. segment. Yeah, one segment. Then continue it in the, in the series. Paragraph. Paragraph. What what? Paragraph? 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 Every episode. And you're gonna you're going to be our book guide. Yeah. We don't get much oh, happening. You're spoiling me. I didn't know the boy got irritated. Come on. Okay. Hey, okay. Um, stop the spoiler. What did I What's say? the beginning? Okay, anyway, let's start. <coughs> now I know the boy got irritated. The boy's name was Santiago. Dusk was falling as the boy arrived with his herd at an abandoned church. The roof had fallen in long ago, and an enormous sycamore had grown on the spot where the sacristy once stood. He decided to spend the night there. He saw to it that all the sheep entered through the ruined gate and then laid some planks across it to prevent the flock from wandering away during the night. There were no wolves in the region, but once an animal had strayed during the night and the boy had to spend the entire next day searching for it. He swept the floor with his jacket and lay down, using the book he had just finished reading as a pillow. He told himself that he would have to start reading thicker books. They lasted longer and made more comfortable pillows. It was still dark when he awoke, and looking up, he could see the stars through the half-destroyed roof. I want to just sleep a, lo a little longer, he thought. He had had the same dream that night as a week ago, and once again, he had awakened before it ended. He arose, taking up his crook, began to awaken the sheep that still slept. He had noticed that, as soon as he awoke, most of his animals also began to stir. It was as if some mysterious energy bound his life to that of his sheep with whom he had spent the last two years, leading them through the countryside in search of food and water. They are so used to me that they know my schedule, he muttered. Thinking about that for a moment, he realized that it could be the other way around, that it was he who had become accustomed to their schedule. But there was, there were certain of them who took a bit longer to awaken. The boy prodded them one by one with his crook calling each by name. He had always believed sheep, that the sheep were able to understand what he said. So there were times when he read them parts of his books that had made an impression on him, or when he would tell them of the loneliness or the happiness of a shepherd in the fields. Sometimes he would comment on them on the things he had seen in the villages they passed. But for the past few days, he had spoken to them about only one thing. The girl, the daughter of a merchant who lived in the village, they would reach in about four days. He had been to the village only once, the year before. The merchant was a proprietor of a dry goods shop, and he would always demand that the sheep be sheared in his presence so that he would not be cheated. A friend had told the boy about the shop, and he had taken his sheep there. I need to sell some wool, the boy told the merchant. The shop was busy, and the man asked the shepherd to wait until the afternoon. So the boy sat on the steps of the shop and took a book from his bag. I didn't know shepherds knew how to read, said a girl's voice from behind him. The girl was of the typical region of Andalusia, with, a flowing, with flowing black hair and eyes that vaguely recalled the Moorish conquerors. Well, I usually, usually I learn more from my sheep than my books, he answered. During the two hours that they talked, she told him that, sh that she was the merchant's daughter and spoke of the life of the village, where each day was like all the others. The shepherd told her of the Andalusian countryside, Andalusian Andal Andal countryside, and he knew glasses, and related the news from the other towns where he stopped. It was a pleasant change from talking to a sheep. How did you learn to read? The girl asked. The girl asked at one point. Like everybody learns, he said, in school. Well, if you know how, if you know if you know how to read, why are you just a shepherd? The boy mumbled an answer that allowed him to avoid responding to her question. 
he was sure the girl would never understand. He went on telling stories about his travels, and her bright, moorish eyes went wide with fear and surprise. As the time passed, the boy found himself wishing that the day would never end, that her father would stay busy and keep him waiting for three days. He recognized that he was feeling something he had never experienced before, the desire to live in one place forever. With the girl with the raven hair, his days would never be the same again. But finally, the merchant appeared and asked the boy to shear for a sheep. He paid for the wool and asked the shepherd to come back the following year. And now it was only four days before he would come, he would be back in that same village. He was excited and at the time uneasy. Maybe the girl had already forgotten him. Lots of shepherd passed through selling their wool. It doesn't matter, he said to sheep. I know other girls in the other places. But in his heart, he knew that it did matter. And he knew that shepherds, like seamen and traveling salesmen, always found a town where there was someone who could make them forget the joys of carefree wandering. The day was dawning, and the shepherd used a sheep in the direction of the sun. The shepherd urged the sheep in the direction of the sun. <laughs> they never have to make decisions, he thought. Maybe that's why they always stay close to me. The only things that concerned the sheep were food and water, as long as the boy knew how to find the best pastures in Andalusia, where they would be his friends. Yes, their days were always the same, with the seemingly endless hours between sunrise and dusk, and they had never read a book in their young lives and didn't understand when the boy told them about the sights of the cities. They were content with just food and water, and in exchange, they generously gave their wool, their company, and once in a while, their meat. If I became a monster today and decided to kill them one by one, they would become aware only after, the mo after most of the flock had been slaughtered, thought the boy. They trust me, and they've forgotten how to rely on their own instincts because I led them to nourishment. The boy was surprised at his thoughts. Maybe the church, with the sycamore growing from within, had been haunted. It had caused him to have the same dream for a second time, and it was causing him to feel anger toward his faithful companions. He drank a bit from the wine that had remained from his dinner of the night before, and he gathered his jacket closer to his body. He knew that a few hours from now, with the sun at the zenith, the heat would be so great that he would not be able to lead his flock across the fields. It was at the time of the day when all of Spain slept during the summer. The heat lasted until nightfall, and all that time he had to carry his jacket. But when he thought to complain about the burden of its weight, he remembered that, because he had the jacket, he had withstood the cold of the dawn. We have to be prepared for a change, he thought, and he was grateful for the jacket's weight and warmth. The jacket had a purpose, and so did the boy. His purpose in life was to travel, and after two years of walking the Andalusian terrain, he knew all the cities of the region. He was planning on his visit to explain to the girl how it was that a simple shepherd knew how to read, that he attended a seminary until he was 16. His parents had wanted him to become a priest and thereby a source of pride for a simple farm family. They worked hard just to have food and water, but like the sheep, he studied less. Just like the sheep! <laughs> how, are you, how are you avoiding words? Hmm? I'm skimming, I'm trying to speed read this, Jack. You want to go to continue? Started, he, studied Latin, he studied Latin, Spanish, and theology, but ever since he had been a child, he had wanted to know the world, and this was much more important to him than knowing God and learning about man's sins. One afternoon, on a visit to his family, he had summoned up the courage to tell his father that he didn't want to become a priest, that he wanted to travel. People from all over the world have passed through this village, son, said his father. They come in search of new things, but when they leave, they are basically the same people they were when they arrived. They climb the mountain to see the castle, and they wind up thinking that the past was better than what we have now. They have blonde hair or dark skin, but basically they're the same as the people who live right here. But I'd like to see the castles in, a town, in towns where they live, the boy explained. Those people, when they see our land, say that they would like to live here forever, his father continued. Well, I'd like to see their land and see how they live, said his son. The people who come here have a lot of money to spend, so they can't afford to travel, his father said. Amongst us, the only one, 
<laughs> the only ones who traveled are the shepherds. Well then, well then, I'll be a shepherd. His father said no more. The next day, he gave his son a pouch that held three ancient Spanish gold coins. I found these one day in the fields. I wanted them to be part of your inheritance, but use them to buy your flock. Take to the fields, and someday you'll learn that our countryside is the best, and our women are the most beautiful. And he gave the boy his blessing. The boy could see in his father's gaze a desire to be able himself to travel the world, a desire that was still alive despite his father's having had to bury it over dozens of years under the burden of struggling for water to drink, food to eat, and the same place to sleep every night of his life. The horizon was <coughs> tinged with red, and suddenly the sun appeared. The boy thought back to that conversation with his father and felt happy. He had already seen many castles and met many women, but none the equal of I mean but none the equal of the one who awaited him several days hence. He owned a jacket, a book that he could trade for another, and a flock of sheep. But most important, he was able every day to live out his dream. If he were to tire of the Andalusian fields, he could sell his sheep and go to sea. By the time he had had enough of the sea, he would already have known other cities, other women, and other chances to be happy. I couldn't have found God in this seminary, he thought, as he looked at the sunrise. Whenever he could, he sought out a new road to travel. He had never been to that ruined church before, in spite of having traveled through those parts many times. The world was huge and inexhaustible. He had only to allow his sheep to set the root for a while, and he would discover other. I mean, he would discover other interesting things. The problem is that they don't even realize that they are walking a new road every day. They don't see that the fields are new and the seasons change. All they think about is food and water. Maybe we're all that way, the boy mused. Even me, I haven't thought of other women since I met the merchant's daughter. Looking at the sun, he calculated that he would reach Tarifa before midday. There, he could exchange his book for a thicker one, fill his wine bottle, shave, and have a haircut. He had to prepare himself for meeting with the girl. And he didn't want to think about the possibility that some other shepherd with a larger flock of sheep had arrived there before him and asked for her hand. It's a possibility of having a dream come true that makes life interesting, he thought, as he looked again at the position of the sun and hurried his pace. He had suddenly remembered that in Tarifa, there was an old woman who interpreted dreams. The old woman led the boy to a room at the back of her house. It was separated from her living room by a curtain of collared beads. The room's furnishing consisted of a table, an image of the sacred heart of Jesus, and two chairs. The woman sat down and told her to be seated as well. Then she took both of his hands in hers and began quietly to pray. It sounded like a gypsy prayer. The boy already had no experience on the roads with gypsies. He also traveled, but they had no flocks of sheep. People said that gypsies spend their lives tricking others. It was also said that they had a pact with the devil and that they kidnapped children and, taking them away to the mysterious camps, made them their slaves. As a child, the boy had always been frightened to death that he would be captured by gypsies and this childhood fear returned when the old woman took his hands in hers. But, he has, but she has the sacred heart of Jesus there, he thought, trying to reassure himself. He didn't want his hand to, be, be, he didn't want his hand to begin trembling showing the old woman that he was fearful. He recited on Our Father silently. Very interesting, said the woman, never taking her eyes from the boy's hands, and then she fell silent. The boy was becoming nervous. His hands began to tremble, and the woman sensed it. He quickly pulled away his hands. I didn't come here to have you read my palm, he said, already regretting have come. He thought for a moment that it would be better to pay her fee and leave without learning a thing, that he was giving too much importance to his recurrent dream. You came, all, you came so that you could learn about your dreams, said the old woman, and dreams are the language of God. When he speaks in our language, I can interpret what, he's, what he has said, but if he speaks in the language of the soul, it is only you who can understand. But, whichever it is, I'm going to charge you for the consolation. 
Another trick, the boy thought. I mean, not a trick, the boy thought. But he decided to take a chance. A shepherd always takes his chances with wolves and with junk. And that's what makes a shepherd's life exciting. I have had the same dream twice, he said. I had dreamed that I was in a field with my sheep when a child appeared and began to play with the animals. I don't like people to do that because the sheep are afraid of strangers. But children always seem to be able to play with them without frightening them. I don't know why. I don't know how animals know the age of human beings. Tell me about your dreams, said the woman. I have to get back to my cooking, and since you don't have much money, I can't give you a lot of time. The child went on the child went on playing with my sheep for quite a while, continued the boy, a bit upset. And suddenly the child took me by both hands and transported me to the Egyptian pyramids. He paused for a moment to see if the woman knew what the Egyptian pyramids were, but she said nothing. Then, at the Egyptian pyramids, he said the last three words solely, so that the old woman would understand. The child said to me, If you come here, you will find a hidden treasure. And, just as she was about to show me the exact location, I woke up, both times. The woman was silent for some time. Then she again took his hands and studied them carefully. I'm not going to charge you anything now, she said, but I want one-tenth of the treasure if you find it. The boy laughed, out of happiness. He was going to be able to save the little money he had because of a dream about his in treasure. Well, interpret the dream, he said. First, swear to me. Swear that you will give me one-tenth of your treasure in exchange for what I am going to tell you. The shepherd swore that he would. The old woman asked him to swear again while looking at the image of the sacred heart of Jesus. It's a dream in the language of the world, she said. I can interpret it, but the inter interpretation is very dif difficult. That's why I feel that I deserve a part of what you find. And this is my interpretation. You must go to the pyramids in Egypt. I have never heard of them, but if it was a child who showed them to you, they exist. There you will find a treasure that will make you a rich man. The boy was surprised and then irritated. He didn't need to seek out the old woman for this, but then remembered that he wasn't going to have to pay anything. I didn't need to waste my I didn't need to waste my time just for this, he said. I told you that your dream was a difficult one. It's the simplest things in life that are the most extraordinary. Only wise men are able to understand su understand them, and since I'm not wise, I have had to learn other arts, such as the reading of palms. Well, how am I going to get to Egypt? I only interpret dreams. I don't know how to turn them into reality. That's why I have to live off what my daughters provide me with. And what if I never get to Egypt? Then I don't get paid. It wouldn't be the first time. And the woman took the boy to leave, saying that she had already wasted too much time with him. So the boy, boy was disappointed. He decided that he would never again believe in dreams. He remembered that he had a number of things he had to take care of. He went to the market for something to eat. He traded his book for one that was sicker, and he found a bench in the plaza where he could sample the new wine he had bought. The day was hot, and the wine was refreshing. The sheep were at the gates of the city, in a stable that belonged to a friend. The boy knew a lot of people in the city. That was what made traveling appeal to him. He has always made new friends and he didn't need to spend all of his time with them. When someone sees the same people every day as had happened with him at the seminary, they wind up becoming a part of that person's life. And, when, and then they want to change, that person to change. If something isn't what others want them to be, the others become angry. Everyone seems to have a clear idea of how other people should lead their lives, but none about his or her own. He decided to wait until the sun had sunk a bit lower in the sky before following his flock back through the fields. Three days from now, he would be with the merchant's daughter. He started to read the book he had bought. On the very first page, it described the burial ceremony, and the names of the people involved were very difficult to pronounce. If he ever wrote a book, he thought he would present one person at a time so that the reader wouldn't have to worry about memorizing a lot of names. When he was finally able to concentrate on what he was reading, he liked the book better. The burial was on a snowy day, and he welcomed the feeling of being cold. As he read on, 
An old man sat down at his side and tried to strike up a conversation. I'll continue from here. <clears throat> what are they doing? The old man asked, pointing at the people in the plaza. Working, the boy said dry the boy answered dryly, making it look as if he wanted to concentrate on his reading. The old man persisted in his attempt to strike up a conversation. He said that he was tired and thirsty and asked if he might have a sip of the boy's wine. The boy offered his bottle, hoping that the old man would leave him alone. But the old man wanted to talk, and he asked the boy what book he was reading. The boy was tempted to be rude and moved to another bench, but his father taught him to be respectful of the elderly. So he held out the book to the old man for two reasons. First, that he himself wasn't sure how to pronounce the title, and second, that if the old man didn't know how to read, he would probably feel ashamed and decide if of his own accord to change benches. Hmm, said the old man, looking at all sides of the book as if it were some strange object. This is an important book, but it's really irritating. The boy was shocked. The old man knew how to read and had already read the book. If the book was, and if the book was irritating, as the old man had said, the boy still had time to change it for another. It's a book that says the same thing almost all the other books in the world say, continued the man. It describes people's inability to choose their own personal legends, and it ends up saying that everyone believes in the world's greatest lie. What's the world's greatest lie? The boy asked, completely surprised. It's this, that at a certain point in our lives, we lose control of what's happening to us, and our lives become controlled by fate. That's the world's greatest lie. That's never happened to me, the boy said. They wanted me to be a priest, but I decided to become a shepherd. Much better, said the old man, because he really liked to travel. He knew what I was thinking, the boy said to himself. The old man, meanwhile, was leaping through the book without seeming to want to return it at all. The boy noticed that the man's clothing was strange. He looked like an Arab, which was not unusual in those parts. Africa was only a few hours from Tarifa. One had only to cross the snow, the, the narrow streets by boat. Arabs often appeared in the city, chopping and chanting their strange prayers several times a day. Where are you from? the boy asked. From many places. No one can be from many places, the boy said. I am a shepherd, and I have been to many places, but I come from only one place, from a city near an ancient castle. That's where I was born. Well then, you could say that I was born in Salem. The boy didn't know where Salem was, but he didn't want to ask, fearing that he would appear ignorant. He looked at the people in the plaza for a while. They were coming and going, and all of them seemed to be very busy. So, what's Salem like? He asked, trying to get some sort of clue. It's like it's always has been. No clue yet, but he knew that Salem wasn't, wasn't in Andalusia. If it were, he would already have heard of it. And what do you do in Salem? He insisted. What do I do in Salem? The old man laughed. Well, I'm the king of Salem. People say strange things, the boy thought. Sometimes it's better to be with the sheep who don't say anything, and still better and still and better still to be alone with one's books. They tell their incredible stories at the time when you want to when you want to hear them. But when you're talking to people, they say some things that are so strange that you don't know how to continue the conversation. My name is Melchizedek, said the old man. How many sheep do you have? Enough, said the boy. He could see that the old man wanted to know more about his life. Well then, you've got a problem. I can't help you if you've got you can't help you if you feel you've got enough sheep. The boy was getting irritated. What? Oh, okay. <laughs> We're gonna edit this part out. <clears throat> the boy was getting irritated. He wasn't asking for help. He wasn't asking for help. It was the old man who had, who had asked for a drink of his wine and started the conversation. Give me my book, the boy said. I have to go and gather my sheep and get going. Give me one tenth of your sheep, said the old man, and I'll tell you how to find the hidden treasure. <clears throat> the boy remembered his dream, and suddenly everything was clear to him. The old woman hadn't charged him anything, but the old man, maybe, he was her husband was going to find a way to get much more money in exchange for information about something that didn't even exist. The old man was probably a gypsy too. But before the boy could say anything, 
The man leaned over, picked up a stick, and began to ride in the sand of the plaza. Something bright reflected from his chest with such intensity that the boy was momentarily blinded. With a movement that was too quick for someone his age, the man covered whatever it was with his cape. When his vision returned to normal, the boy was able to read what the old man had written in the sand. There, in the center of the plaza of that small city, the boy read the names of his father and his mother and, this, and the name of the seminary he attended. He read the name of the merchant's daughter, which he hadn't even known, and he read things he had never told anyone. I'm the king of Salem, the old man had said. Why would a king be talking with a shepherd, the boy asked, awed and embarrassed. <clears throat> For several reasons. Let's say that the most important is that you have succeeded in discovering your personal legend. The boy didn't know what a person's personal legend was. It's what you have always wanted to accomplish. Everyone, when they are young, knows what their personal legend is. At that point in their lives, everything is clear and everything is possible. They are not afraid to dream and to yearn for everything they would like to see happen to them in their lives. But as time passes, a mysterious force begins to convince them that it would be impossible for them to realize their personal legend. None of what the old man was saying made much sense to the boy, but he wanted to know what the mysterious force was. The merchant's daughter would be impressed when he told her about that. It's a force that, that appears to be negative, but actually shows you how to realize your personal legend. It prepares your spirit and your will because there is one great truth on this planet. Whoever you are, or whatever it is that you do, when you really want something, it's because that desire originated in the soul of the universe. It's your mission on Earth. Even when all you want to do is travel, or marry the daughter of a textile merchant? Yes, or even search for treasure. The soul of the world is nourished by people's happiness, and also by unhappiness, envy, and jealousy. To realize one's personal legend is a person's only real obligation. All things are one. And when you want something, all the universe conspires in helping you to achieve it. They were both silent for a moment, observing the plaza and the townspeople. It was the old man who spoke first. Why do you tend to a flock of sheep? Because I like to travel. The old man pointed out to a baker standing in the shop, win in the shop window at one corner of the plaza. When he was a child, that old that man wanted to travel too. But he decided to buy his bakery and put some money aside. When he's an old man, he's going to spend a month in Africa. He never realized that people that people are capable at any time in their lives of doing what they dream of. He should have decided to become a shepherd, the boy said. Well, he thought about that, the old man said. But bakers are more important people than shepherds. Bakers <laughs> Okay, old man. Bakers have homes while shepherds sleep out in the open. Parents would rather see their children marry bakers than shepherds. <laughs> Ouch! Ow. Oh. The boy felt a pang in his heart, thinking about the merchant's daughter. There was surely a baker in her town. <laughs> <laughs> the old man continued, In the long run, what people think about shepherds and bakers becomes more important for them than their own personal legends. The old man leaped through the book and fell to, to reading a page he came to. The boy waited and then interrupted the old man just as he himself had been interrupted. Why are you telling me all of this? Because you are trying to realize your personal legend and you are at the point where you are about to give it all up. And that's when you appear, you always appear on the scene? Not always in this way, but I always appear in one form or another. Sometimes I appear in the form of a solution or a good idea. At other times, at a crucial moment, I make it easier for things to happen. There are other things I do too, but most of the time, people don't realize I've done them. The old man related that the week before, there had been for he had been forced to appear before a miner and had taken the form of a stone. The miner had abandoned everything to go mining for emeralds. For five years, he had been working in a certain river and had examined hundreds of thousands of stones looking for an emerald. The miner was about to give it all up, right at the point when, if he were to examine just one more stone, just one more, he would find his emerald. Since the miner had sacrificed everything to his personal legend, the old man decided to become involved. 
he transformed himself into a stone that rolled up to the miner's foot. The miner, with all the anger and frustration of his five fruitless years, picked up a stone and threw it aside. But he had thrown it with such force that it broke the stone and it fell upon. And there, embedded in the broken stone, was the most beautiful emerald in the world. People learn early in their lives. What is the reason for being? said the old man with a certain bitterness. Maybe that's why they gave up on it too, so early too, but that's the way it is. The boy reminded the old man that he had said something about hidden treasure. Treasure is uncovered by the force of flowing water, and it is buried by the same currents, said the old man. If you want to learn about your own treasure, you will have to give me one-tenth of your flock. What about one-tenth of my treasure? The old man looked disappointed. If you start out by promising what you don't even have yet, you lose your desire to work toward getting it. The boy told him that he had already promised to give one-tenth of his treasure to the gypsy. Gypsies are experts at getting people to do that, sighed the old man. In any case, it's good that you've learned everything in life has its price. This is what the warriors of the light try to teach. The old man returned the book to the boy. Tomorrow, at the same time, bring me a tenth of your flock, and I will tell you how to find the hidden treasure. Good afternoon. And then he vanished around the corner of the plaza. Wow, what an intro for this episode. So, what do you guys think? It's interesting. interesting. I like it. I like it because the boy... The boy's just very curious. Yeah, yeah. the boy wants to know about, yeah. uh, about the I'll... dream. He just thinks it's a random dream. And then suddenly two people are saying, Hey, 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 hey. That sounds very. That sounds. That sounds intriguing. And Give also, me one tenth of what you have. <laughs> <laughs> and also, it's interesting because the boy he likes God? it. Huh? Well, we don't know. We don't know. We don't know. Is, it is, is it God? Is it God? Is it an angel? Maybe. Is it an angel? I don't, I don't know. know. Let's see. Spoiler alert! It was God. The old man. The old man said I that mean, he it just is turned. It's obvious. In... Old man, a weird clothing. <laughs> what? Said he was in a form he said of a an stone. Arab clothing, Jamie. Uh, he said he, was, he took. He, he, Took the form of a stone before. Well, see, Jamie, could be an angel. I like to be an angel. A person, a person can be in the form of a stone. How do you know? How do you know? Well, that's what we'll have to see. We'll get to have to see next chapter. Personal yes. legends. Yes. So. This is interesting. It's, it's, it's in relation to yes. law of attraction. Wow. Yes. Yeah, you can see that you can really see the connection to. Are we really halfway done through the book? Already? No, we are not. We're like one fourth. One tenth. One tenth. <laughs> Read me one tenth of the book, and I will tell you what your treasure is. But yes, that concludes the first reading of the Red Couch discussion for this series. So thank you for watching. Please join us next time for another episode of It's Time the Red Couch Discussion. Bye, bye everyone. Bye. And see you bye. Very soon.